give a life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken give life, you give love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, great are you, Lord, it's your shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are
your breath. It's your breath yeah. in our lungs. So we pour out. So we pour out our praise. Thank you, Jesus. Pour out our praise. It's your breath. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Strength will rise. Even though many of us are mourning, we know that strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. In our waiting, we gain that strength.
Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hard to conceal. Can't imagine all the pain I feel. Give anything to hear half your breath. I know you're still living your life after death. Him from 
his goodness and your loving father's kindness. We are grateful to God that we are here to stand with our family and to celebrate and give God praise for the life of Philip St. Christopher Edward. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we will be glad in it. And we're thankful that even in moments like this, our faith is cemented in the hope of God that he will be our comforter and he will be our help. Not only does the Lord give us comfort, but he is the comforter. So through him, with him, we are blessed to be. Grateful to God, I want to welcome you all today to this service, honor the memory of my cousin. And we will, as heavy as, as our hearts are today, we will remember him and the joy and the humor that he brought to our lives love that he showed us. I'm going to ask you, please, if you will remain standing as I invite Elder David Collins to come and pray the opening prayer. In the name of the Lord. Let us bow our heads. Eternal Father, Lord God, we thank you. Praise your holy name. For it is in you, Lord God, we look in Genesis and we find that you breathe the breath into man. And it was you who were the author. So therefore, Lord God, we come to you. We ask you, Lord God, to understand our grieving and our tears right now because you have created someone who has given us so much memories. You have created someone, Lord God, that had loved people and just enjoyed everybody. So therefore, Lord God, we thank you, but we hold on to the memories. So therefore, Lord God, we ask, Lord God, a blessing upon us, Lord God, that we continue this legacy. Lord God, we ask that the essence of him being in the room, of him being on the planet, resonates with us and with our thoughts and with the joy and with the laughter we share. We ask, Lord God, and we thank you because you told us that we are wonderfully made. Therefore, Lord God, we humbly bow before you and offer, Lord God, the body, Lord God, which you gave to us. Lord God, we thank you. We praise your holy name. And today, Lord God, we worship you for who you are and for who we are. Bless us now. Remember the family, those who are hurting. Lord God, be a comforter, be a healer. Walk by their situation and just tap them on the shoulder and let them know that you are there and you are God. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Philip was born and raised in the church and it is to the hymns of the church that we now reach for as we join together singing, leaning on the everlasting arms, the Words will be, are in the booklet. We ask that you join and let us sing together and present our worship to the Lord in the name of Jesus.
and flow many arrows pierce my soul from without where they but my lord lead me on through him i must wait oh i want to see him to look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace of the sweets of glory let me lift my voice So you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We reach now for the word of the Lord. We're going to invite Minister Jonathan David Livingston to come and lead us in the reading of the Lord's word as we continue in this service. We may as well go on and have a praise and worship service and give God praise for what he has done in our life. Praise the Lord, everyone. Um, our scripture reading today will be taken one from the new, one from the old. Um, we'll be reading Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Praise the Lord. And the word of the Lord begins as thus. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Glory be to God. In the second scripture, we will read from First John. the book of first John and um, beginning from verse number e from chapter 4 sorry beginning from verse number 11 beloved if God so loved us we ought also to love one another no man have seen God at any time if we love one another God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. 
God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. May the Lord have his richest blessings of his word to our heart and may they comfort us in this time of bereavement. Bishop, in Jesus' name. song together, knowing the goodness of God, we ask that you turn and praise team will come and lead us as we celebrate the Lord. I'm going to invite you to stand as we celebrate and sing together. Phil knew about the goodness of God and understood that it was because of God why we are all here today. So for those of you that have robust voices, we ask that you lift them as we dedicate this time to fill. Will you please stand? On page five of your program, the words are there. Please join us as we sing. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never failed. sing it one more time but I just want to remind us in here today it was not an alarm clock that woke you up this morning 
it wasn't your own self intuition that made you open your eyes there is a God there is a God and we live because of him we breathe because of him so whether you have faith or not there is something called manners when somebody does something for you our parents told us to do what say thank you all of us learned that whether you're saved or not we have manners so because we know the Lord woke us up this morning come let's say thank you let's say thank you let's say thank you it's his goodness I will sing of the goodness of God serve it God you've been so good you've been so Lord you've been so you as you see be seated here today we're grateful for the Lord we thank God for his presence with us and we give God all the glory and the honor that is due unto his name and I pray that in this service that someone's heart will be turned towards him and we will be reminded always of his goodness Sometimes a person has to fall asleep for others to wake up. And it is our hope today that this service will not just be a funeral, but it will be an opportunity for us to give God praise. We're now going to enter into a portion of our service whereby family members will come and
and share tributes, of course, we do get the family latitude. And I do want to make available this opportunity to PJ and Cortland and Esme if they want to. I know that this is a difficult time, a difficult time. And Tareen is going to come. Esme is going to come. I'm going to afford it. PJ, you come in? No. That's all right. That's okay. We know that this is it's tough for me to be up here at the funeral of a dear cousin and little brother. It's difficult. And oftentimes we say in these moments we have mixed feelings. I have one feeling today. <laughs> Sadness. Mm. It's the only thing I'm experiencing. Yeah. But I give God praise even in this. Mm. That God will be glorified. Yeah. Come. Tareen is coming. Following Tareen's presentation. And, okay, Cheryl's going to come. Stand after Tareen comes, then uh, Brother Irving is going to soothe us with a musical rendition. Then after that, we will go further into, this is Tareen and this is Cheryl. Good morning, everyone. From an early age, my sister and I were very close to our uncle. We would stay in Bristol a lot. I remember him being tall, fat, and mighty. He'd hold out his arms and allow us to hang from each arm. He would take Cheryl everywhere, leaving me with Gran. He pretended Cheryl was his child, and he'd go out with Cheryl a lot more than me. One day, my gran said to him, Philip, why aren't you taking both of them? He said, no, Anne's hair's too picky and I won't get the girls. <laughs> so gran sent one of my aunts to town for a couple of bonnets to tie underneath my neck to hide my hair. When we went to the shop, and Philip and I used to buy a lot of sweets and crisps and knickknacks was our favorite. We'd have three or four packets and we'd give Cheryl one. She'd always complain and cry, cry. Till one day, Gran picked her up and flinged her in the sofa. The bounce was epic. Me and my Uncle Phil just laughed. We'd often tease Cheryl about her friend Garner at school, how he'd fancied her. It would distress her a lot. And we, would, we only did it to make her cry. But as a kid, you don't think about the mental implications and the fact that we were bullying her. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> Skip forward five years. I'm now 15 years old. He'd collect me from my mum's and we'd go driving. We'd check his friends and have fun. Big kids we were. He taught me how to drive at the age of 15. He said, get in the driver's seat and drive. I said, how? He said, he explained cl clutch control, but never explained anything about the brake. Until we ended up on the roundabout. This never happened again, and I've been driving 35 years illegally and 28 years legally, <laughs> thanks to my uncle. When I was visiting my gran, me and Phil would sneak out for a cigarette. Gran would smell it in her room, God knows how. She'd shout down, Philip! Why in God's name are you smoking? Who's smoking? He'd shout down, it's Anne Marie, mum. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. That's when I looked at him and he put his praying hands together and begged me to take the rap. He'd say, look, you can go back to Birmingham. I've got to live with her. He'd always call me his favourite. I knew all his secrets and things he got up to. Him covering for me and me covering for him. So much so, Phil used to work as a security guard at Newtown Shopping Centre in Birmingham. On a night shift mainly. He'd always have plans of his own firm. He wanted to call it Phase 2. I don't know why, but that was just one of his dreams. The shopping centre was down the road from my mum's house. I told my mum, I'm going to chill with my Uncle Philip, which I often did while he was at work at the night. When I got there, I asked him to cover for me, and he did. 
done partying and living my best life. Or so I thought, until my mum had a feeling and sent my dad to collect me from the shopping centre. Philip told him, she's just gone, you know, here, and she'd just leave. But at that, point, point, at that point, I didn't even reach there. He had my back 100%. Him knowing that I'd never lost a fight, he'd always call me Buzzra because I'm, I was rough and boisterous. Philip's godbrother, Norman Donaldson, used to say in Sunday school, I want to be just like my godbrother, drive rental car and have enough gal and money. Can you imagine the Sunday school teacher's face? If we rolled out together and came across any of my friends, he grabbed me to the side and said, don't tell them I'm your uncle. My uncle was very fond of most of my friends. He'd always ask about them. Michelle, Tracy, Rita, especially Sophia, and in later years, Sal and H. They were my articles, but they were his articles too. Phil and I would go bingo regularly, but due to the pandemic, that all changed. We always made a pact that we'd go to the Christmas party at the gala bingo in Warsaw every year. Some of my family members would ask if they could come with us, and in unison, we both said no. He always, he always, <coughs> he always was the last to arrive and the first to leave. If you travelled with him and you weren't ready, he'd leave you. It was never hello, but yo. Never are you okay, but tell me no. He'd walk in my house, kiss me on the cheek, and head straight for the kitchen, banging cupboards as he went along, always eating and looking food, moaning if his favourites weren't in stock. White chocolate was his favourite. He never came empty-handed, though. Always a strawberry syrup and a bulla cake. Gifts I appreciated. Once chilling, he'd put his head on my lap and force me to sort the bumps out of him underneath his beard. He did that to a lot of he did that to us a lot, especially me and my mum. But nobody else wanted to do it. Picture him now. When jokes sweet him, he wouldn't laugh out loud. He'd do that rarely. He'd stay quiet and laugh from within. His eyes would stream with water from the laughing, and you knew you knew he was on your wavelength. He loved his nails and manicures. He loved his Fahrenheit aftershave. He loved brands, the brands Dior and Fila. He also loved the cars, Bentleys, and wearing caps. And the cap I wear today will represent him wearing his caps every day. His taste in music was centered around Biggie Smalls and other artists from that era. I think he had a small case of OCD. His clothes had to be color coordinated in the wardrobe and his clothes that he was wearing had to be color coordinated too, from cap to hat to shoes to trainers. Today, today, he wears his favorite mustard jacket. He once ran jokes with me that if I didn't bury him in his mustard jacket, he'd come and bang up the kitchen cupboards them at night time. It was truly an honor to dress scene in our onks. He made it so easy for me, making sure that you meet our savior, looking exactly how you wanted to. What would you say? I look dapper, I look suave, I look handsome, I look sharp. The girls, them sugar. And you do. I'm sure you smiled at me when I was dressing you. But I imagine that. Just one last smile that I'll never see again, man. We're going to party today, Phil. We're not in the cry cry team. Somebody's got onions somewhere. I know you hated the cry cry team. You were my favorite uncle and friend. I'm going to miss your Uncle Phil. I love you.
for the saints that's wondering what. You're not going to find that one. But thank you, Irvin. It's just so good to see so many family members and friends that have traveled far and near to come. We certainly appreciate it. I want to acknowledge uh, Philip's godfather who is here, Deacon Hibbert. Will you please stand, sir? The deacon's <laughs> Philip's godfather. I don't think Mommy, Mommy D isn't here. Uh, uh, Mother Davis McDonald, who's his godmother, uh, um, and his god sister, you will hear her later. We're going to invite now Alicia and Bronte to come, followed by Gerald and Jeffrey. Now, one thing, Phil, he always had a nickname for, for people around him. Um, my nickname, he nicknamed me Ash. Don't ask, but I remember the night that I got that nickname. The preacher, this was Big Cat. <laughs> my brother was Big Cat. I remember Janine asked me one time, how did you start calling Gerald Juice, Philip? <laughs> Philip started calling him Juice. So, and then I came in and I said to Jeffrey, didn't he used to call you Godfrey? He said, yes. So he had nicknames for all of us. So Alicia and Bronte is coming. And um, then Gerald, and I'm going to ask Gerald and Jeffrey, try don't talk everything today because <laughs> we'd be here till next week. And some of it, I know, is in the top secret file. You, you, you can't talk those things publicly. <laughs> so, all right, so let's start with Alicia and Bronte. Hmm? Oh, it's a video. I'm sorry. It's a video tribute by Alicia and Bronte. Video, please. And then My Uncle Jerry Phil Jerry. always used to say he's got two girlfriends. His black girlfriend has always been Tony Braxton and his white girlfriend has always been pink. So this is for you, Unks. This is how we started all our conversations. When I used to call him or he used to call me, it was always, Lily, and I'd be like, yes, onks. And then he used to chat out the whole of the family business. <laughs> Uncle Phil was like a second father to us when we were growing up, he was so good to us. He used to pick us up from school and our school is on the main roads and you're not allowed to park outside the school. But Uncle Phil would turn up, despite being told numerous of times not to park outside the school, he'll turn up in his green tomcat rover with the black rusty hood blasting biggie and waiting for us uncle phil our route home was never a direct route home though he always used to take us to the chocolate box before we got home and i remember him telling everybody bronte i know i'll get changed from but leisha and i'm not going to get changed from leisha because leisha love a chocolate and bronte love our money Wednesdays were the days that you knew you'd see Uncle Phil. He used to always come round on a Wednesday for his dinner. If it wasn't a Wednesday and you weren't expecting him, you could tell it was him at the door by the way he used to pop off the doorbell and shout because he was taking too long to open the door. Uncle Phil's the only person I know who can walk into your home, go straight to your fridge or turn around and ask, anybody want a cup of tea? When Uncle Phil was round, you can guarantee it's either a cooking show you're watching or a quiz show. Uh, whether it was The Chase or Tipping Point, you had to sit there and you'd watch them and Uncle Phil would get every question and he'd just reel them off. He probably missed two or three. And then my dad would be sitting next to him and my dad would be getting every question wrong. And he used to turn to my dad and say, come on Fred, even if they gave you multiple choice, you'll still get them wrong. Uncle Phil at his best was confident. You, could, you would even say he was bossy, but he was still so loving and still so humble and he did his best when he could and he would show you his little ways of affection and love that he had towards you only the way he knew how. But he could tell a story 
Uncle Phil used to tell these stories that used to have you on the edge of your seat and used to wait for the punchline and he used to deliver every time. He used to captivate a room with these stories and you'd be hooked in. No one can tell a story like Uncle Phil. I'm going to let you in on Uncle Phil's humour now. I'm going to try and tell a story. I'm not going to deliver it the same way he would. No one can do that. But I'm going to let you in on how he used to run joke. So when I was younger, I must have been about nine, ten. It was about Valentine's Day. And Uncle Phil came round the house and he walks in and he's holding this rose. And at the bottom of the rose, there's this bear and the bear's holding a heart that says, I love you. And Uncle Phil goes to me, Lily, some boy at the road told me to give you this. I said, some boy? Who, Unks? What's his name? I'm automatically like. He says, I don't know his name, just some boy at the road. <laughs> I went off skipping that day. Years later now, Uncle Phil comes in and he's handing me different items. He gave me a sewing kit and said, Lee, put that in your bag. Make sure you've always got that in your bag. He comes in another day and gives me a fan. And then this fan, when you turn it on, <laughs> has big red letters, flashing lights that says, bingo. I started to add two and two up and I used to think, what are all these gifts that he's given me? Are they from the bingo? And I, I, remember, I remember the bear and I thought, it couldn't be. And it clicked. He only went and won it at the bingo. Tommy, a boy at the street, gave it to me. Only Uncle Phil. I love my Uncle Phil. He wasn't perfect, but he did his best by us. He was friendly and loving and caring. There's not a day that I don't miss him. Unks, you have left a hole, a void in my heart. That is unbearable. And no one can feel. But I understand. And I hope you realise that you touched so many people's lives. I hope you knew just how much you were loved. You were here on purpose. Your life made impact you were so strong and i am so proud of you every adversity that you went up against you fought but do you know what Anks? you don't have to fight anymore you can rest now so rest uncle phil and i love you and cherish every moment forever love you always To Uncle Phil, thank you for picking me up from school every day. I'm pretty sure I love sweets because of you. I will miss being able to text you the night before to ask if you could do breakfast the following morning, whether that be at Morrison's, Ikea or the Greedy Pig. I will miss being able to watch the um, cook shows with you, whether it be Master Chef James Martin Saturday morning kitchen in the British menu. I'm yet to find that ice cream in better than Cornish. You never missed a milestone for me. You visited me at uni on several occasions. You were at my graduation, you were at my wedding and when I got my first house, you came and visited me for dinner. Um, I never forget the time when we went to Turkey. We would wake up early in the morning to chase the sun when we round the pool, deck chair to deck chair, just so we could get a tan. <laughs> um, then we noticed that there was a fun fair on the other side of um, the hotel and we would go and play bumper cars. Um, one time I accompanied Uncle Phil to Bingo um, and I called house on a touchpad and obviously I called it wrong and he said he'd never take me back to Bingo ever again, for shaving it. Um, I never forget the time we went to Bristol and we got crossed by a gram because we turned up the fire on, on Hamilton so it would be nice and soft. You'll always come back from Bristol with one or two things for me, either meatballs or Johnson syrup. I'll never be able to hear the phrase, hey, yo, Babs, because everyone was Babs. Have you got anything to follow me? And you'll reply, things tight. Um, the time you and I went to Harvesters just before they introduced sweet potato fries, you let me drive your car home. I used to see you at least once a week for years. A typical Wednesday would look 
like me coming home from college i'll get a text from uncle phil saying what are you cooking so i reply oh i'm not cooking today mom's cooking then i hear a knock on the door and he was sitting coming and sitting in his usual spot and then i put the kettle on and it's always peppermint with four sugars we will sit and watch the chase and the soaps he'll say something funny i'll piggyback on the back of that and he'll reply don't give me no jokes bronx and we'll be in stitches um, there was one week where I said I couldn't see you and I'll see you the following week and you said why so long? I said I'll try and see what I can do. Thank you for teaching me with for Barnes in the summer. It was a white t-shirt with jeans and you could never go wrong with that. You were the best storyteller Uncle Phil. I'm going to miss you. Life will never be the same without you. Thank you for everything that you've done for me. say praise the Lord. Um, this day is real. I've been dreading this day. Last night I didn't sleep a wink. <sighs> Philip. Philip was my, my cousin, but he was also my best friend. Um, when we were seven years old, um, my brother John passed away. And right then, took the role of big brother. Um, I remember we used to sneak into dad's room and, and use his um, aftershave. But he was a man of, it had to be like a brand. And I think at the time his favorite aftershave was Chorus. But me and Gerald, we just used uh, Brute 33 <laughs> or, or Old Spice. And when things was really bad, couscous. <laughs> and that, af that aftershave, you only could get it in Jamaica. <laughs> but you know, he, he, he was like a big mentor to me. In fact, the way, we, the way we grew up, we even dressed the same. Until people used to think that we was twins more than my own twin brother here. Um, when we used to go to Eve Road, we was always down Eve Road. And then we'd get outside on the Saturday and me and Gerald, we used to do rock, paper, scissors. Because none of us didn't want to knock the door. Because anyhow the bedroom window opened, you know you's in trouble. Auntie would stick her head out the window and say, Jeffrey, Gerald, it's what in the world? Auntie would come to see Philip. And after she done cuss us out, she would say, what in the right door? I say, yeah. You know, we, the one time Auntie gave Philip 50 pounds to do a shop. And back them days, that was a lot of money. Now, one thing about Phil, he loved the arcade games, especially Space Invaders. And he's there playing the games. And I'm saying, Phil, what about the shopping money? He says, it's all right, James. I, I win it back. And then the, the, it went from 50 pounds to 40 pounds. I said, Phil, man, the money. It's all right, James. I'm going to win it back. So he moved from the Space Invaders to the fruit machine. And then there was nothing left. I said, Phil, math is not my strongest point. But I believe that zero plus zero equals zero. So you don't have nothing to win it back. So he came up with this plan. He said, James, we'll have to make out that we got mugged. <laughs> I said, Auntie ain't going to fall for that. So he said, all right, let's make it realistic. Let me thump you in your face. <laughs> I said, thump who? I said, you want me to thump you? But he said, no, let me thump you because you know I can't take lick. <laughs> The man was a legend, legend. The man was a legend. You know, you could put him in a room and he will light up, light up the room. He was going to London one time 
and the, the, the young people in Bristol put on a party for him. And they couldn't understand why I wasn't crying. I wasn't upset. I said, because I know by the end of the month, he'll be back. <laughs> Philip went to work the Monday and didn't wake up to Wednesday. And he was back in Bristol by the Friday. Legend. Man was a legend. Legend. I, I, he, was, he was a legend. We don't have enough time today, family and friends and brethren, to talk about our beautiful cousin. And just listen to what Jeff was saying. You know, I, I, I wasn't even going to say much, but because I now know that Deacon Ibert is in the house, I just wanted to share this with you. And Deacon, I'm going to bring this back to your memory. We grew up in, 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 in Bristol Church, and one thing we would try and do on a Sunday is try to hide behind the pillars so Bishop couldn't see us at Sunday school time because he would ask us to recite the Sunday school. And Philip would go out just at the right time when we were asked to recite the Sunday school. And we would go out with him thinking that we're with our big cousin. And then while we stood by the door, Philip would just push us in into the church. And that's the time when Bishop would spot us. And say, All right, Brother Joe, you said the Sunday school. And Philip would be on the other side of the door laughing his head off. He, he was always up to something. And we didn't mind the Sundays, but Thursdays was, was boring to us. And so this one Thursday, Deke, we, Philip and I went upstairs in the kitchen, and we found a piece of bacon in the fridge. And Philip decided to fry the piece of bacon. <laughs> Bishop's downstairs preaching, and Philip's frying bacon <laughs> in the kitchen. And that became our, our new reason for going to church on Thursday. Because after those weeks, we would start bringing, like, sausage and egg. I'm not kidding you. And one, this one Thursday, we had, I bought sausage, egg, and mushrooms. Philip had beans, fish finger, and order bread. And we're in the church. They say confession's good for the soul, right? <laughs> we, are, we are cooking up a storm. We sit down to eat this meal. We even blessed it. We, as we're about to eat the, eat the food, Deacon Nibbert walks through the door. What's in the doing up here? Get outside the church. So, of course, we went back down inside the church and we're sitting there. Philip's upset because we, the food's upstairs. And we were down, we were down there for about 10 minutes and thinking, Where, where's Deacon? <laughs> uh, we never knew what happened to that food, you know. It was probably disposed of. But Philip was saying, trust Deacon to smother Deacon before he concentrate on God. Because Philip had a religious side to him, you know. He, he. So we thought we got away with it. Come Sunday morning, we're in Sunday school at the front of the class, making sure we were in the right place at the right time. Deacon comes over, Bishop wants to see you. So as soon as Philip heard that, he started crying same time. So we go across to the office, and as soon as the door opens, Bishop's there, he grabs me inside, and he's got a drumstick in, the other, in his other hand. And I'm thinking, I didn't even know Bishop even played drums. <laughs> <laughs> so he gives me two licks, and Bishop would beat you and then tell you why he beat you. So he grabs me, beats me, he gives me two licks, and says, I'm, I'm going to beat you because you have my first name. Then he grabbed Philip, give him two licks, he's like, I beat you because you have my last name. And that was the, the, the end of our cooking days in, in, in Bethel Church. But, you know, I, I, you know I, I was doing my tie today. Ken's here somewhere. Ken was helping me do my tie. And it, all, all these memories come flooding back because when I went, I, I went to the same school as Philo. I was in the first year. He was in the third year. And I remember when I got to school, Phil, my first day, Phil saw me and said, man, man, that's not how you do a tie, man. And did my tie. And my tie was long and short. He made it. Uh, long and skinny, he made it short and fat. That was the style. Philip was always into style. He was the first person to, to, to teach me how to put a seam in my jeans. Iron the seam into the jeans, and you had to have a seam. And, and you couldn't go near Philip and have a double seam. He would spot that and tell it your trousers got double seam in it. But Philip was so precise in his dressing. And I tell you this, beloved one, he, yes, he did love the Lord. Philip came to church 
There's this one time, though, that he, he, someone upset him in church. And Philip, he was 18 now, he decided that he wasn't going to come to church. So we didn't see him for a few weeks. And I remember that at a prime meeting, and they said they were praying for Philip and uh, Sister Needham's house. And at the end of the prime meeting, Sister Needham said to Sister Sis, you, 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 you see Philip? And she said, no, no, Philip, Philip backslide, you know. And she said, what, you mean you go back further than where he was? <laughs> but, but Phil, Phil came back to church. Phil came back to church. And Phil, Phil, was, Phil was a worshiper. Dai was a worshiper. He, he loved the Lord. And I'm going to Philip Stone. Trish, I got one more for you. I got one more for you. So we're now big men. Philip's a big man. I'm an electrician. And Philip says to me one day, he says, Juice. Dex explained about the, 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 the nicknames. Yeah, he said, Juice, man, listen, I'm checking the things up in Leeds, you know. I said, okay, okay. Yeah, man, she's wicked. He said, but the thing is, you know how much 20 P's it take to phone Leeds? No mobile phones then. And he was using the, the, the pay, pay as you go. He said, listen, Juice, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to put a telephone point in my bedroom. So I said, Phil, man, that's not a good idea, you know, because last time I did a job in your house, auntie banned me from the house, you know. <laughs> she said, like, you don't pay no bills in the house, and I'm, she don't let, me, don't let Philip give you any more jobs. So he said, listen, cuz, just come to the house on Thursday night. Dad will be at church. Mom's working nights, and you could do it then. So I came to the house. I put the telephone point in for Philip. And Philip, he, he had the phone already, so he plugged in. When I was packing up, Philip was on the phone to whoever. About a month later, I see Philip. Philip said, because mom says, don't come back to the house again. <laughs> I said, what, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? He said, mom said, don't come back to the house ever again. I said, what? I said, cuz, she found out about the telephone point. I said, Philip, what do you mean she found out that she knows you've done it, cuz? I said, but how did she find out? You told her, didn't you? I said, Phil, you didn't have to tell her. He said, but cuz, she had my hand. She had a hand on my throat. <laughs> so Philip said, this is Philip now. This is Philip version. He said, I'm in the room talking to the girl. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I hear, Philip, is who in the room with you? Philip says, oh, no, no one, mom, no one, no one, no one, no one. He said, by the time he said that, mom pushed the door open. He says, mom looks at the phone, follows the wire down to the socket, flick off her slippers, take her heel, and bust off the, the socket off the skirting board. And he said, Jared, Jared, I'm on the phone to the girl, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, listen, I'm going to have to quit. Uh. And that was Philip. He was such... A funny guy. He had us joking. Uh, every time Philip walked into the room, he lit the room up. And I said to Jeff, what, what do you do? What do you do when the life of the party no longer has life? What, what do you do? But Philip would want the party to continue. Philip would want us still to be happy and live fruitful lives. We are glad to have known him. We are honored to have known him. We are privileged to know him. And I want to say to my beautiful cousin, Rest in peace. I love you so much. God bless you. I forgot to tell the Brooks Brothers two minutes apiece. Because, but they could have gone. So many memories. So many, many, many memories. And you will hear, of course, and you will see throughout the pictures... Philip was indeed, I think it was uh, at least that said he was bossy. But he got that from his dad. Uncle Edmund Emerson. And one thing with Philip, he would look good. He'd have on all the designer clothes and designer this. And I'd say, Philip, give me your money. And the boy, Dex, me broke you, no man. <laughs> but you know it go. You have to look good. <laughs> That's Phil. That's Phil. My goodness. Coming now will be a song of reflection by Justin and Alan Clark, family friends. Great classic. I started to say the Commodores. It's not the Commodores. It's Commission. <coughs> commission song. And following that, we'll go 
into some French, into some more tributes. And I, now I'm going to have to just announce we need to be leaving here by 1.15 so that we can get to the cemetery. So I'm going to ask everyone, please, just to govern. Do your best to govern yourselves accordingly. All right? Uh, Justin and Alan is coming at this time. Um, I'm not Alan, by the way. No, you're um, <laughs> unfortunately, Alan's broken down. Um, so they've asked me to to um, try and jump in instead. So um, bear with me, Pat. I've not even practiced this song or anything. So uh, this is Justin. This is Alan's son. Um, and I think... Um, He, he, I think he loved, Justin sang this song when he was, how old was he? <laughs> I think he was something like 12 years old, very young. Um, so um, Phil loved when he sung the song when he was just a wee little boy. Um, and so we're going to attempt to sing this song today. So them said, don't listen to the voice. Don't listen to the words. But if you don't listen to the voice, you won't hear the words. Okay, we're going to try it anyway. Any key, Dave.
God bless you. Thank you so much, guys. Excellent, excellent. Just a lot of good memories. Good, good memories. We're now going to where we will invite friends to come with their tributes. First, the Kenny Hall, best friend, Wayne Lawrence, Kevin Clark, and Neil Walker. Will you come in that order, please, and offer your tributes, and then we will again celebrate with music. Kenny? Wow, there's so much I want to say, and I find it really hard to, but we all grew up in Easton in Bristol, and our stomping ground was Felix Road, our venture playground. It was brilliant, you know, I used to go on Mock Philip, um, Felix coming out, yeah, yeah, yeah. He used to come and knock me. He said, Ken, you coming out? Yeah, 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 I'm coming out, I'm coming out. Until one day, I went round to knock a billet. It must have been the time where Jerry put in the, 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 <laughs> the telephone cord. I knocked the door. I said, where's Phil? You coming out? His mum turned around and said to me, Phil? is not coming out. It must be the time when, uh, wow. Sorry. What a good man, eh? What a good man. Greetings and good morning, everyone. Bless you. Um, I'm hearing all those stories, and they took a piece of what I was going to say. So now I'm up here with fresh, fresh information. Uh, my condolences, first and foremost, to the family. Uh, we are close. We've been close over 30, 40 years. Edmonds and Lawrence's. Um, and I remember when I was a young child and Philip says, move to Bristol. And I said, move to Bristol, just like that. And he goes, yes, because you know me, you know James, you know Juice. And I, that's what I did. The same day I said to mom, I'm going to Bristol. You have job? <laughs> and he said, no, Philip will look after me. All right. So I said, dad, dad says, see you when you come back. So I went to Bristol. And funny enough, they did. And that's, it was a Sunday morning. And Philip says, you going to church? Well, yes, let's go to Bristol Church. And we sat in the church. We just took ours. Let's go back to Gibson Road. Let's go sing. So we went to Gibson Road that same Sunday. We have to sit down. And he says, mm -mm, let's go back to Bristol Church. I said, we just sat down. And he goes, no, we went back to Bristol Church. And Philip was there going, okay. And I said to him, anything you need, I'm going to give it to you. If you're hungry, I'm going to feed you. And I went there, and I was quite hungry. And Philip says, my dinner is your dinner. And I went to Eve, Eve Road, and Philip had his dinner shared out. And he put a plate aside, and he gave me half his dinner. And that time, Philip was quite a big man. Wavy hair, all combed back. Called him Prince. And yes, he was a charmer. And... After he started losing weight, Philip says, I can't call shit no more. <laughs> so I quickly got the job. And he started binding me, Jeffrey, and Gerald. And I thank you for that. Because uh, he made Bristol a lot easier for me to. But my job took me very quickly back to Birmingham. And funny enough, Philip was in Warsaw. So that is even closer to me now. So every two, three days, I go to Philip. 
I need to stay, I need to talk on menus. And you know, it's like Martin Spencer's biscuits, certain brand, and it's color coding. You look in the bathroom, the same color toilet paper matches, towel, clothes all ironed up for the weekend. How do we find time to do that? Because I find it very hard, but it was flat, planned, every day, what to wear, color coding. Um, and I remember on a Thursday, he showed me his new Warsaw boys, which was Neil and Kevin. We were going to talk after that. And we all bonded with them every Thursday, playing cards. And so sometimes he said to me, let's go for Lorna's. Let's go play cards. So we went for Lorna's and played cards. And that's how he, he sort of like brought me back into the Warsaw people that he had. But there's certain words that everyone's talking about, which is caring, sharing, and loving. And everyone I've heard so far has said the exact same thing, because that's who he was. Sometimes people only talk good about people when they pass away. We told Philip when he was alive, that's the kind of person he was. And even on a bad day, he still cared for you. And that's the goal to his flat and tap, tap his window. He goes, come on back. But if I didn't do this within two days, he'd phone me. He says, what's happened to him? And Philip says, no, no, come to the house. But sometimes we don't even talk. We just sit down there and just reason about something random. And to me, that's the kind of person he was. He drew the crowd. He wasn't a, a shepherd. So he wasn't a sheep, he was a shepherd. So he didn't follow the crowd. But yes, he loved bingo. And I went one with him, one time with him. Um, and we shouted out house. I said, Philip, you win? He goes, no, you win. He said, check my cards. <laughs> it was that fast he could check other people's cards with him. Um, so I know time is short, but Philip, I couldn't believe this morning when I woke up and I couldn't get dressed because if I got dressed, it means I'd have to believe that he's gone. So the longer I let him to get dressed, it, it's just going to sink in. And never I see his pictures and read, it's hard because sometimes you don't really know how much you love someone until they're gone. Um, and Philip, to me, he hasn't gone because he will always have a place in my heart, regardless. Um, so on the behalf of myself and the Lawrences and my family, Philip, you're going to be missed, greatly missed. Um, but you will always have a part in everyone's hearts today. And this is nothing to the amount of people that, the amount of people that Philip knew. And I believe even, even if he had a Calvin way, he could still build that place. And this is only a quarter of the people. Um, so... Philip, you missed condolences once again, and I'll continue to pray for you all. Thank you for this time. Amen. He's a good guy, just we had we had good times together, we parted hard, so we're gonna part it hard for you today, so rest in peace. <laughs> greetings, greetings to all the people of Rock Church and the listening crews today. Phil, what's your name? Dior, Dior, <laughs> Danger. <laughs> I don't know why I call yourself Danger. <laughs> but no, I think it was because he used to wear red. But uh, <laughs> he calls himself that. But we had many more names. Obviously, some of the names we can't <laughs> we can't say here. We, so um, I know I can see some people looking at me funny. Please don't say it. <laughs> but Phil, I mean everything that everybody said. They just said everything. The first thing that comes to me about Phil, bossy, bossy, bossy. How many have got no money? He's bossy. Yeah? <laughs> He said, just look like you have money. And he, he said, don't matter if you just make sure you. And so when Phil dressed, sometimes I used to go check Phil and then feel like I have to go back home and get changed again because <laughs> Phil had white, red, white, red shoes, red belt. He, he was to a T. I've never seen anything like it. If I could say it was Phil, it was, Phil it was anybody from the Bible, I would have called him Joseph. Every color I'm at. You have every color, blue, red, yellow, green, everything Phil have. I will, 
you know, for over over 20 years, me and Phil was friends for over 20 years. To, you know, Phil used to, I, I, I used to get, I, I used to tell Phil like even sometimes he never lied to me. You know, Phil used to come and he used to spend a lot of time at my home. And Phil, I used to be cooking food and I quarrel with Phil when I give him the food. Because I, I said, Phil, what are you doing? The first thing Phil do is put salt on the food. He hasn't even tasted the food. <laughs> Phil doesn't taste the food. And he put salt on the food every single time. I said, Phil, you know, even taste the food. Why you put salt on it? He said, because I know. I said, this man, if it was anything else, it was sugar. I said, Phil, where you put your sugar? You know, I know, I love sugar. And I said, like, but one thing about Phil, I've never seen a man drink so much water. This man couldn't catch no diabetes. You know, this man couldn't catch anything. Nothing couldn't take him. Salt couldn't take him. Sugar couldn't take him. Phil was the man, he was just water, every water, three pints of water, straight after a thing. If you went round to Phil's house, careful, can you have a diabetes check? Because that, that Guinness punch, not God, I think he put about three tin. <laughs> and this was milk, condensed milk in there, honestly. It was that bad. I think, you know, Phil was so sweet. You didn't, in fact, you just have to be with him because you wouldn't even need a woman to look at you just if you got Phil. Because when Phil walked through the gap and we follow him, they all thought we had that nice aftershave on. You understand? Know <laughs> Phil lingered all down the place. <laughs> we, you, you feel you could smell, you could see and everything else. But we had such a great time that, you know, in fact, there was probably about 3,000 teeth when we was all together because you could see pure tea light up the whole place. Because we had so much enjoyment, fun, and laughter, and joke, like nobody could do, nobody can't replicate that. We really did, I, and you know, to seeing everybody and hearing the stories, Phil was constant. He was constant, fun, joke, protector, look after, spoke about his family, loved his family, loved his people in Bristol. I know everything about people in Bristol. Get him in chat, uh, <laughs> no, Phil chat. Yeah, don't make him have a drink. <laughs> Feel chat. <laughs> Feel chat. But that was a beautiful thing. But we had a we had a beautiful <laughs> friendship. A beautiful friendship. Yeah. You know. And you know, one at a time, I I, I kinda look after Phil. When when Phil wasn't too strong, I used to say, Phil, come on, man. Let's go park, man. Let's go and train. Let's go and do this. He said, No, Neil, you you know I'm sick. I said, Come on, Phil. I said, Come on, man. Let's just go. Because Phil had the thing, like, even though he lost weight, he always used to flex his muscle. He had one tennis ball year after he lost weight. And he's always going on like his bad. Always this little tennis ball in his arms. And the, anyway, going back to that story, I, I went to the park. I said, Phil, come on, man. Let's go to the park, man. Let's go and just do a little workout. He gets on straight. And he said, all right. He said, I'm not running, though. I said, all right, go and run. I said, bring your bike. And me and Phil went out and... You know, reached the park gate and we started to just, you know, go. He was riding, I was running. And he took off. He left me. He gone. And the only time I saw Phil was when he was leaving the park. I said, where are you going, bro? He said, I'm done. I'm going. I said, <laughs> I said, Phil was like that, but you just had to have love for him. You stay with him and things like that. We grew close. And we had this bond between all of us, Victor, Michael, Ken, all the people. We, we had so much of a big unity. Anne-Marie used to come down, Sophie. We, that we had such a big crew that we used to go out and enjoy ourselves. And it's, go, it, it, it's going to be missed. It held me for a good week, you know, when he passed. But I'm telling you, we, he's not going to die. We're going to carry on celebrating the friendships, Michael, Wayne, Victor. We will, and we'll keep that. The family, you know, we will keep in touch and spend that time. But I'd just like to say, like, you know, we just have to give thanks for Phil and, the, and what he's created, the people yeah, that are here yeah. right now. We have to rest because truly, you know, PJ, you know, anytime you're ready, Courtney, anytime you're ready, I'm here. Please, just call. Just call. We're here for you, man. Yeah? All right. Blessings and love to you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Such good memories. Really, really um, I think it was Kenny that mentioned the Adventure Park on Felix Road. Now, if you know about that, 
you're old. Because that's back in the day. That's back in the day. Such good memories. If you're here and you were a choir member back in the 80s, and you sang on a choir, stand on your feet. If you were a choir, you sang on any choir anywhere back in the 80s, stand on your feet. We're going to sing an old song. Dan, I don't know. Maybe we need Copeland on this one. <laughs> someday, someday, I will be called up to meet him or to be ready. That's for you, Phil. That one is for you. We are so blessed to have so many bishops, pastors, leaders here today, and we honor you and we thank you for coming. I'm going to invite Bishop Lance Dino to come just to speak on behalf of the Bethel District 7, from which the, the district that Phil grew up in, amen, he will come and just share uh, words on his behalf, and then after that, uh, David, Elder David Copeland is going to come, and then we will have unity. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Praise the Lord, and good afternoon, everyone. To God be the glory. Uh, we 
of course, we extend first and foremost uh, deepest condolences to to the entire family, of course, to Bishop Weston, PJ, to Pat, to Diane, to Lorna. Some I know, so I don't know the kids, grandparents, grandkids, and everyone, the whole family. We just know that this is, while we're, while there is a, a lot of laughter, there is also a deep sense of loss. And so at this time, um, I just want to um, assure you that we're praying for you and reassure you that we're praying for you and that um, we believe, as the scripture says, um, that God will not leave you comfortless. He said, I will come to you. When I think about Phil, and he grew up with us in, in the Bristol church, and in the Bristol group, part of us, part of the fabric of the, of the district, I would say, um, I'm reminded of a, a young man who was gregarious, very friendly, very engaging, very likable, uh, as many of you have said before, gone speakers have said. But um, I always remember Phil in football. Football was one of his, his, his passions. Um, and I remember when we, uh, we played against Walsall, uh, that, that, infamous, that infamous game against Walsall. Walsall. And we didn't come off as Bristol, Bristolians. We didn't come off. Bristol Church didn't do too good. I guess because they had Brother Fred in their team. Amen. Praise God. But, you know, we, we have some happy memories, great memories um, of, of his life. And uh, clearly he touched all of us. And the fact that so many people are here today is a testament to that. But once again, uh, please be assured, I say, I repeat, that we're praying much for you, that God will take you through. That Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Lo, I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the age. So on behalf of District 7, my wife, who would love to be here but couldn't make it, uh, the pastors, leaders, and saints in District 7, may the good Lord bless and keep you as we continue to support and pray you through. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Amen. Five one, I think it was. He's my friend, so I, do you know who was in goal for us that day? Neville Levy. I think we changed it after four one, but by then it was, it was too much. Elder David Copeland is coming, and afterwards, I'm going to invite buddy, friend, Victor Shaw to come who will read the eulogy that was compiled by the sisters Lorna, Diane, and Caroline in that order. Elder? Greetings to everyone um, and special condolences to the Edmonds family and all families that are connected with me and friends. We offer our condolences on this day of probably mixed feelings because my tummy is hurting me right now after all of the um, the laughter. But um, I've got a story myself, but I might leave that for today of Phil and, it, and, and, and it's kind of funny. But I've been asked to sing this song, which is um, a favorite of Phil, so I understand. So um, we'll, we'll do it. Jesus said, here I stand, will you please let me in? And you said, I will tomorrow. Jesus said, I am he who supplies all your needs. And you said, I know, but tomorrow. I thought about today, but so much 
much easier to say tomorrow. Promise you tomorrow. Better choose the Lord today. For tomorrow, very well might be too late. Jesus said, I am here to supply all your needs. And you said, I know tomorrow, Jesus said, here I stand, won't you please take my hand, and you said, I will, but tomorrow, oh, tomorrow, I give my life. Tomorrow, I thought about today. Oh, but so much easier to say. Tomorrow, I promise you, tomorrow, better choose the Lord today. For tomorrow, very well. And who said tomorrow would ever come for you? Still you laughed, laughed and played, and continued on to say tomorrow. Forget about tomorrow. You give your life today. Oh, please don't just turn and walk away. Tomorrow, who promised you tomorrow? Better choose the Lord today. Your Tomorrow could very well begin today. Good job, good job. Rick. While Vic is coming, can we just give God praise for the sisters that are here? Lorna, Diane, yeah. Caroline, it's Trish. And, and, and let's just give Fred a big hand, too. Love you, man. Appreciate you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, some people in here love God. Can you praise the Lord, please? Yeah, I had a feeling you would. Um, I've been asked by the family, uh, Lorna, Diane, and Patricia, to actually read the eulogy. So for me, it's indeed a pleasure, uh, a privilege uh, to be able to read this. Um, I've got to share something very quickly. I got, I got saved in church about 83, and that's when I met Philip. Philip was age 17. We went to a church convention in North London. And I was coming from a, a Church of England background. I knew nothing about Pentecostal Church, really. And that service was a very powerful service. There was a young minister preached at the time. His name was Minister Dexter Edmonds. Okay. We then finished the lunch break, and we were walking outside up the road. And some of the young people were really fired up, and they saw a young man who was looking destitute. He was actually looking homeless. He was looking really rough. Um, I'd say probably even mental health issues, but he was looking really, really disturbed. They chased after him and they said, you know, come on, we want to pray for you. But he was looking angry. And at that point, myself and Philip was walking up behind and there was somebody else. But I remembered 
I looked over and I realized the young man had a knife in his hand. It was a very big knife. From my background, when I see a man with a knife, I kind of make me want to back up. So then the young people kind of turned around and said, Minister Dexter, Minister Dexter. And I saw Minister Dexter looking kind of wise and wisdom and cautious. But then they pulled him along and he went up and he, he prayed for the young man. But as he's approaching the young man, Philip being typical of Philip, there was a, a house being renovated nearby. And outside of the house was a big skip. And there was a brick. And Philip grabbed the brick and Philip said, Victor, Victor, in case prayer doesn't work. <laughs> the, prayer, the prayer worked because now we have Bishop Dexter. <laughs> so, okay. Philip St. Christopher Edmund was born in Bristol on the 22nd of January, 1966 to the late parents of Eustace and Isilda Edmund. Philip was the youngest of four siblings. After giving birth to three girls, Lorna, Diane, and Patricia, his mother was overjoyed that she had finally given birth to a baby boy. Phil attended Banner Bannerman Road Infant School, and then he attended St. Gable and Eastern, sorry, and East, sorry, Eastern Road Junior School and went on to attend St. George Senior School. In school, English was never his strongest subject, but he excelled in other subjects, with maths being his favorite. As Phil had an interest in mathematics, it was no surprise his highest result was an A in maths. Phil was a very popular pupil. He was loved by everyone, both teachers and fellow pupils. He was nominated as a prefect and house captain at his school. Phil used to play rugby and football. He was also part of the ice hockey team as he was fearless on the ice. And his school years were the happiest years of his life. Phil was also a big support, sorry, Walsall. Phil was a big supporter of Liverpool. <laughs> okay, everybody's clapping. Nobody, Walsall ain't clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Phil gained a qualification in engineering and welding and at the Fishbond, tra the Fishbond Training Center. He then relocated briefly, I think, Jeffrey said how brief it was. He then re relocated briefly to London in the mid-80s and lived with his uncle Noel and auntie Marie as he secured a job at a company where he was a welder. After a short while, Phil returned home to Bristol. I think Jeffrey said it was about a week, yeah? After a short while, <laughs> Phil returned home to Bristol. He was then employed at MFI Furniture Company for a number of years, and from there he became a retail manager at Graham's Furniture Company on Gloucester Road. The family union was, was a priceless gift from God, as Phil was a happy and contented child, just a typical boy full of energy. Phil brought so much fun and laughter to his family home, he would have everyone in stitches, and there was never a dull moment when he was around. Phil had a very close bond with his parents. He would refer to his father as his best friend and said, should he ever get married, his father would be his best man. However, Phil was definitely a mama's boy. As he was spoiled by his mom, they would even phone each other up to three to four times a day. That is the loving relationship they had. Phil, as we call him, was raised in a Christian home with godly principles and values. Phil was baptized and became part of the youth team. He was an active member of the Bristol Bethel Church Youth Department and the Young Brotherhood Group. Once Phil entered into his adulthood. He was faced with some difficult life challenges. However, however, Phil was blessed with a family that loved him, and they rallied around to ensure nothing less than family support and family love. Following this episode in his life, Phil moved to the Midlands to be with Pat and Fred under their close care. He quickly adjusted to living in the Midlands and became very much part of their immediate family and a second father to Alicia and Bronte. Despite Phil's ill health, it didn't phase him from trying to live a normal life. He lived independently in a cozy flat which he loved. Although he loved being around people, he loved his own space. He always had a play playlist in his car as he had a love for, for music, particularly 90s hip-hop, R&B, including artists such as Biggie Small, Tupac, and Tony Braxton. Phil enjoyed life and gained so many friends along the way. Age was no barrier. He could relate to people from all walks of life. 
despite the issue. And Sophie formed many friends within the Warsaw community. The happiest moments of his life was uh, with his children. Philip Jr., affectionately known as TJ, Cortland, and Esmond. They meant the world to him, and there's nothing he wouldn't do for them, and they loved him dearly. He enjoyed traveling abroad whenever he had the opportunity. He spent his 50th birthday in the capital island of the Caribbean, Jamaica. That caused trouble now. And also <laughs> looked forward to annual holidays with his sister, Pat. Phil also loved the family cruises, and, and in addition, had a special love for the local, um, I call it Buzz Bingo. Anne-Marie gave it the proper name, but um, he always loved the bingo. He and his niece, T, would often go to the bingo Christmas party every year, and as mentioned before, they would be there together, nobody else invited. As we all know, Phil had a love for food, as he would often ask for his sister Diane's curry mutton, meatballs, stew peas, and rice. Phil also loved sweets, as we've heard, and he always had a sweet tooth, not forgetting carrot juice with every meal. On the 21st of September, 2022, Phil had one of several surgical operations on his esophagus, to resolve a long-running compli complication that he had when he was swallowing food. The operation itself was successful. Unfortunately, there was non-diagnosed health issues reoccurring, which led to him being placed in the intensive care unit three times. He was eventually discharged on the 14th of December in the care of his sister, Pats, where she provided a wide range of support for him. On, the, on Friday, the 24th of February, this year, Phil was rushed to hospital. Sadly, on the Monday, 27th of February, Phil passed away due to a heart attack. He passed peacefully surrounded by his family. Phil leaves behind three sisters, Lorna, Diane, and Patricia. His three children, TJ, Cortland, and Esmond. His nieces and nephews and an army of friends stretching around the globe. For his family and friends, and those who knew him, somehow this world will never be the same. But our loss is heaven's gain. Rest in peace, Philip St. Christopher Edmonds. And could you give him a round of applause, please? Thank you, Victor. And he said that Philip's impact uh, my wife isn't here, she's in state, she's joining us, but Phil was a part of our wedding party, came to the stage, was part of Bishop PJ's, and the same way that he touched and impacted people here is the same way he did at the stage, and there, there were those there that really uh, remembered him and were shocked when they found that he had passed. I'm going to ask all of the Bristol folks who came up today to just stand. All of the Bristol, I see friends and Bristol family. Come on, stand up. Bristol, stand up. This is where Phil started. This is Phil's home. I appreciate you all coming. Tony, good to see you. Keith, Milt, Roy, just good people. Come on, clap them, will you, for coming. We appreciate you. Floyd, who, who you went to training with. Thank God for all of you all of the people, and of course the family here. We're going to be leaving here shortly and uh, go uh, to the cemetery, and then we will join the family and just come and let us. I think, um, uh, I think Jeff said, let's just keep the party going. He was the life and soul of the party, and as we remember, we will have just great fond memories. Coming now is Sarah Gale, who will sing, We Shall Behold Him, and then the next voice you will hear will be that of another one of Phil's cousins, uh, Bishop PJ, who will come uh, with the eulogistic message. Amen. And we will be blessed. This has been, touch somebody, look at your neighbor and said it wouldn't have been the same without you. <laughs> I think Phil would be very, very happy. We have laughed. We have sung. We have enjoyed each other. And... Uh, we just thank you all. Come in. All right. God bless.
shall unfold, preparing his entrance, and the stars shall applaud him with thunders of praise. B. 
Now together, can we give God praise for the life of Phillips and Christopher Edmund? With the exception of the family, can everybody stand and just give God a great praise for the life that he shared with us? Come on, everybody clap your hands out of gratefulness. If you loved him, clap. If you respected Philip, clap. If you, if you met him, clap. Wonderful. Somebody say, well done, well done, well done, well done, well done. You may be seated. First of all, it's, uh, it's a great honor to be able to, to just share uh, some, some sentiments about, about Philip, uh, fondly known as our Phil. And um, everything that has been shared so far has been so enlightening and so, uh, and so impactful uh, to realize that someone could touch so many lives in so many different ways. And my, my role simply is to bring some context uh, to this moment uh, because this is a vital moment for all of us. Uh, we really don't live our lives by the years, by the months, by the weeks, by the days, by the hours, by the minutes, by the seconds. Life can quickly change in just one moment. And so I think the older that you get, the more you celebrate the opportunities that you have. And we cannot avoid this moment to share our love with, uh, with the Edmund family, with Pat, Lauren, with Diane, and to everyone that loved Philip. He would want us to remember certain things. And it is in moments like this that we, we often reflect as a way of remembering, because sometimes you have to tell yourself to remember not to forget. Remember not to forget. Uh, the, the eulogy, for those of you that, that may not be familiar with, there, there was a verbal or really a written eulogy that, that Dr. Victor just read. And there's also a, a verbal eulogy. Um, and the eulogy from the classic Greek means to means words of praise. It's a time for us to reflect on an individual, uh, the span of their lives and the things that they've accomplished. It is to reflect and to respect. Uh, the reason why I think that that is key is because in everybody's life, there are ups and downs, there are good and bad. And Philip wouldn't want you to just believe that he was good all of his life. He would want you to understand that life is a mixture of challenges. And what we do with those challenges and how we live those moments, whether you know the Lord or not, all of us at some point in time, will face our moment. And I believe Philip was well prepared. He knew enough about what these moments are about. He experienced the moment with his father, experienced the moment with his mother, and uh, he's experiencing a moment even right now. But for the next few moments, just to, to bring some context to this, and this is by far a difficult assignment uh, because Philip, uh, I just reflected on this, Philip was more of a little brother than a cousin. I always had an older brother, uh, Bishop Dexter, but never had the privilege of having a younger brother to do younger brother things with. Philip was that person. So, in line of the fact that there is a word for every situation, there is a word. Come join me and say, there is a word. There is something to be said about everything. And since Philip could chat, let's chat. Philip would want you to understand that even though there are things that happen around him, he was very in tune with God. 
I'm not talking about his public life. Because sometimes all of our public life can be brought into question. And this is why you ought not really judge anyone by what you think their life is. All of us have a public persona and a private persona. And I believe in the closing days of Philip's life, there were significant private moments that he had. I would think the teachings of his father and his mother and his family and his church reemerged in his mind. As he begins to understand that life is a moment. Now, this is why we really trust God because God does not need a whole year to change you. According to 1 Corinthians 15, for those that know the book, God can do it in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. But for context, let me just read this, this verse of scripture because uh, it's to the word of God that we go when we are confused and hurt and not sure. And while it is easy to think about what has happened the question that most real people ask is, where do we go from here? Because anytime you attend services like this, it brings into question our own mortality. If Philip can go, then all of us can go. And the promises of God and uh, I believe that every person has a piece of God in them, whether they recognize it or not. Promises of God are these, that God gives us three score years and ten. That's what the book says. And if by reason of strength, they be four score. So really, after all is said and done, after all the mistakes and all the great things we do, we really only have 80 years. Now think about it. We only really have 80 years. And so just as a, an announcement to you, if you're over 40, you're in the second half of your life. And even though the first half of your life may not have gone the way that you had planned, Philip wants to remind you, you have a moment today. To think about what comes next. It's written here uh, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 18. And there were a few other verses that I really wanted to, to raise as we look at this. Because I think it's key. In verse uh, 20 and verse number 16. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying that the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan calls David to swear again because he loved him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. Then Jonathan said to David, tomorrow is the new moon. Thou shalt be missed, because thy seat will be empty. I think Reverend Jeffrey brought this to, to light and others that whatever we thought coming into this day, it feels very real right now. Philip's seat is empty. You would always know when Philip was around. Not because he was begging you a sweetie money. But just his presence and his light. Whether you liked him or not, you had to love him. Because Philip had that kind of impact. And so Philip will be missed. The family is going to miss him. But I just want to remind you that his seat can never be filled. 
not fair. There are people that come in and out of our lives and we love them and stone them for different reasons. But something about our fail that was unique and different lived life by a different playbook because he understood what life was really about. So here's some things I think Philip would want me to say. And the first thing is that our Phil had a unique relationship with God. As unique as he was, he had a unique relationship with God. All of us do. And yet, we have to also remember that uh, he knew God in a very different way, though. I remember being in church with, with Phil he would last just after, just after the testimony service. Philip was good with the clap, was good with the praise. We would make fun of people in the spirit. But as soon as the spirit of God descended into the church, Philip would because. He understood that when God showed up like that, things began to change. But he hung around the church long enough and hung around. Uh, Philip was a people's person. He, he just loved people. He hung around people that were different people that were the same. But Philip had a unique relationship with God. I have not come here to mourn today. I've come to celebrate the fact that God somehow had a connection with this young man that was not always obvious. And that's, that's fair to say because some, some of us are difficult to figure out. We want people to know us and we barely know ourselves. We are unique. We are different. And that's, that's the plan of God. He makes us all very different. Different eye color, different head shape, different nose shape. You're different. You're unique by design. And I think it's quite an atrocity then if God makes us so unique that we spend the rest of our lives trying to be like somebody else. You are so unique that no one can replicate your life. No matter how difficult and challenging and painful it is, you are the best you you could ever be. And sometimes we look at other people desiring to have their life, and yet we don't realize. We often say that the grass is greener on the other side, and it's not until you get on the other side you realize it's artificial grass. It's green all the time. So now we have to use this moment. And by the way, there's no other way that Philip could get all of us here. Some of us didn't attend his birthday, didn't attend anniversaries. But today he has summoned us here for one purpose, I believe, to remind us that if you have a gift, you ought to live out your gift in the best that you can. Loved by all. Understood by all. Misunderstood by many. But because of that, we know that he is a special person. So he had a unique relationship. Somebody say unique relationship. To know him was to love him. To be in his presence was to see a light that could only come from God. And so it's through relationship. Uh, I mentioned earlier that he was really a younger brother to me. Uh, Philip is the only one that could make me leave work early to go play snooker. And when we were bored, he would say, let's go youth club. I often wondered where the two went to, but he never said, let's go to youth club. Let's go youth club. But he was such a person that 
you have to acknowledge that he did love the Lord. And he sensed, had desire, had a purpose for his life, had things going on for himself. And since this is a, a reflective moment, my purpose is not necessarily to excite you today, but to call you to think about how do we, how do we process this? For those of us whose hearts are broken, for those of us who are questioning God for why, if you, if you could take anyone, why Phil? Because we have a little list of people we would gladly give to God to take. Why does it appear that God takes the best of us? And perhaps it's God's humorous way of causing us to come to attention. All of us were rocked by this, by this, this, this loss. And yet, here we are, not crying because we don't understand, but crying because we have a loss. And this is, the, this is, the, this is really the, the uniqueness of a human. We can have tears in our eyes and still a praise in our heart. Because even in brokenness, we can celebrate. And even when we're down, we can celebrate. And this ought to be... Uh, the, the celebration that we should continue. Relationship. Brothers and sisters, this is all about relationship. The reason why we're here today is because of relationship. And as I struggle to really understand about relationship, Phil's life was tested in many ways. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, Philip is a survivor. And we may not have heard, we've heard the jovial side, and we've heard the humorous side, and we've heard all of the many funny things that Philip has done, but I, there was a seriousness to this man. You just had to have the right conversation with him. Because many times we use our gift to deflect what's really going on. And Philip, no matter how serious the time was, all he had to do was open his mouth and, and make a joke and deflect from something serious. Because he had a commitment to make others feel better. He just wanted others to feel better, and I understand that. But oftentimes for the, for, the, for the 20 real people that are here, after we've made others feel better, we still have to live with ourselves. We still have to deal with ourselves. And so celebration comes in many ways. And the text bears this out, and I'm, I'm done with this. That there existed between David and Jonathan a love. A love that was so strong that David loved Jonathan, and Jonathan loved David like he loved his own soul. Meaning that there was nothing that David would not have done for Jonathan, nothing Jonathan would not have done for David. There are very few people who will, who will give to you and sacrifice themselves. Philip was one of these guys. That even if he had to give you his last, you would have it. Because somehow he was so gifted that if he gave on the left, somehow someone would give him on the right. He knew how to bless. He knew how to be a giver. There are only two people in this world. We're not even talking about races. There are only two kinds of people in this world. Those that give and those that take. Philip was a giver. And used his gift, I believe, in, a, in an amazing way. His gift was laughter. His gift was humor. He honored the God that created him by living out his purpose. By doing what came naturally. That do, by doing what flowed seamlessly. He was a light and still is a light and has brought so much light to this family that the family... the. 
the atmosphere is just a little darker now. Because Philip is not here. But then on the other side of this, Philip would not want us to come and be miserable and, and upset and vexed. He would not, this is not the kind of party Philip would come to. And if he lived a certain way, I just think that we ought to send him out a certain way. If he lived a life of, of joy and humor and happiness and, and, and danger and risk-taking, then the best way that we can honor the memory of Phillips and Christopher Edmund is to thank God for the life that he has lived while we're contemplating where do we go from here. Uh, it's a question that is worth asking, and if you don't mind, because I don't know if you've spoken to the person you're sitting next to since you've been in here, but will you just be so kind and just ask them this question, look to someone and say, where do we go from here? What will this do? How will this change the way that we perceive his life? Philip changed in certain ways, and it was incredible that he could do the things that he did. But there is a word from the Lord, and the word from the Lord helps us understand that there is no good thing that God will withhold from those who walk uprightly. May I take the next three minutes, I think I'm back together now. To remind you that Philip had a relationship and he was excited about his life. He loved his family. He was excited about his family. He knew how to, he knew how to bring joy to everyone. And so if there's anything we're going to take from this moment, can we just, if we can just grab a piece of Philip's joy. That no matter how he felt, he put a smile on his face. Whether he had money or not, Philip was still going to be kind to somebody else. Whether he had a job or not, Philip was still going to act like he was on the top of the world. Because I believe there was something inside of him that helped him to believe that there was someone great on the inside helping him to live his best life. The last question that I want to address before I go to my seat is this. What do we do with emptiness? How do we handle emptiness? How do I move beyond a place because uh, his seed is empty, can never be filled? But how, how, how is it that we can still celebrate him and really take to count the things that he's done in his life? Well, the seed is empty, but we ought to now know how to fill that with something. This is what the word says, that God is going to give you joy for mourning. That God says, even though weeping may endure for a night, we have an expectation that somehow joy is going to come in the morning. We have confidence in the word of God that the Lord is my light and my salvation then whom shall I fear? This is the kind of stuff that Philip was raised on. And I believe somehow while he was closing out this life, these things that were seeds in his spirit, because the truth of the matter is you cannot escape who you are. It doesn't matter where you go and what you do, there is a seed that is planted in every one of us. And for those of us that are trying to run from it, look in the mirror. You're looking more like your parents than you ever did. Because as much as we try to be different, there is something inside of us that challenges us to be greater. The word of the Lord encourages us. David declared it that I, have, I was young, but now I'm old. I need some faith in this room now. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. This is why we can cry on one side and celebrate on another. This is why we can be broken on one side and joyful on another. 
Oh, I need some faith to show up now. This is why I can be crushed on one side, but be ecstatic on another, because this is not all that Philip had. He experienced joy down here, but what a joy when we get over here. And if you think he was a comedian today, I wish you could see him right now. There is not a dry eye where he is because of the joy and the light that in his life. Now there are many, there are many that will speculate and many that will share. And, 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 and I thought about this and yet the words of Job came to us because Job did not have a concept of heaven or hell. Didn't have a concept. But Job said, Listen to Job. He couldn't describe the place, but he knew there was a better place than this. And Job, in all of his pain, described it as there. Somebody say there. What Job said was there, the wicked cease from troubling. There, the wicked will be at rest. And I want you to understand that because of who Philip was, God loved him and he loved God. And God is shining today and causing us to realize that even though his seat may be empty, his presence is still with us. He will never cease to exist as long as we keep calling his name. And this is one of the reasons why today, Philip's seat will never be filled because his uniqueness and because of his creativity and because of what he deposited into everybody else. I celebrate you today, Phil. I celebrate you for a life well lived. I celebrate you for all the gifts that you placed in our lives. Can somebody celebrate with me? I celebrate for the joy that you brought to our family, we celebrate. Because what would this world be without Philip? Can I offer a prayer today for those who love to raise their hands? Can we do that together? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this moment in time. We thank you for the gift of Philip Edmund. He gave us enough to live on. He gave us enough to run on. He gave us enough to believe on. And Lord, today we pray for our family, the Edmund family. We pray for, for Pat, for the many, for Trish, for the many sacrifices she made as only Trish could do. For the accommodations and the love and the support. And if Philip would hear, was here, he would say, well done, Philip. Pray for Lauren and for Diane and for the family. And there is good news that we will get through this. Because we understand that God doeth all things well. We leave this place recognizing that if God is not on our side. We leave this moment recognizing that if God and has used a young man by the name of Philip. Then where do we go from here? We, we move on with the same expectation and with the same energy to make people's lives a little better. Father, bless nieces and nephews and uncles and family members, immediate and extended family. And I pray that from this moment that we will begin to live in the second half of our lives, better than how we've lived in the first half of our lives. And I pray for those who have not yet been introduced to a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that even through Philip's life, we will recognize that with him in our lives, we can smile at every storm. We praise you now. We give you glory now. In Jesus' name. Can everybody clap your hands and thank God?
So can you really clap your hands and thank God? Really thank God. Hallelujah. Lift your hands. I love to see. I worship at your name. Just want to tell that. Can we just worship that one more time? I'm going by saying, I love you. Everyone, please stand. The benediction now with Pastor Annette. so that they can get into the cars and we will be on our way to the cemetery. God bless. designated pallbearers to escort Phil to the casket. Please come at this time. Yeah. This album is dedicated to all the teachers that told me I'd never amount to nothing. To all the people that lived above the buildings that I was hustling from that called the police on me when I was just trying to make some money to feed my daughter. Yeah, yeah. And to all my peoples in the struggle, you know what I'm saying? It's all good, baby, baby. Check it, check it. It was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine. Something pepper and heavy D up in the limousine. Hanging pictures on my wall. Every Saturday, rap attack, Mr. Magic Molly Mall. I let my tape rock to my tape pop. Smoking with the bamboo, sipping on private stock. Way back when I had the red and black lumberjack with the hat to match. Remember rapping Duke? The ha, the ha, you never thought that hip hop would take it this far. Now I'm in the limelight, cause I rhyme tight. Time to get paid, blow up like the world trade. Born sinner, the opposite of a winner. Remember when I used to eat sardines for dinner? Peace to Ron G, Brucey B, King Capri. Funk Master Flex, Love Bug, Star Ski. I'm blowing up like you thought I would. Call a crib, same number, same hood. It's all good. Uh. And if you don't know, now you know, you know, you know. and personal with Robin Leach yeah. and I'm far from cheap I smoke stuff with my peeps all day spread love it's the Brooklyn way the Moet and Alize keep me pissy girls used to diss me now they write letters cause they miss me I never thought it could happen it's rapping stuff I was too used to packing gats and stuff now honeys play me close like butter play toast from the Mississippi down to the east coast condos and queens for weeks so loud seats to hear Biggie Small speak Living life without fear, putting five carrots in my baby girl ear. Lunches, brunches, interviews by the fool. Considered a fool, cause I dropped out of high school. Stereotypes of a black male misunderstood. And it's still all good, uh. It's all good. 
And if you don't know, now you know. You know. You know. Sega Genesis, when I was dead broke, man, I couldn't picture this. 50 inch screen, money green, leather sofa. Got two rides, a limousine with the chauffeur. Phone bill about 2 G slack. No need to worry, my accountant handles that. And my whole crew was lounging. Celebrating every day, no more public housing. Thinking back on my one room shack. Now my mom pimps a act with mix on the back. And she loves to show me off, of course. Smiles every time my face is up in the source. We used to fuss when the landlord dissed us. No heat. Wonder why Christmas missed us. Birthdays was the worst days. Now we sip champagne when we thirsty. Uh, damn right, I like the life I live. Cause I went from negative to positive, and it's all. And if you don't know, now you know, you know, you know. And if you don't know, now you know, you know, you know. And if you don't know, now you know, you know, you know. Let the beat sound in the house. Julie Mafia, Matt Flavor. I see you, I see you, I see you. Yeah. All right.